Thank you. The world is not designed to be inclusive. The world is designed for the convenience of the majority. It is designed for practicality. Every product you use, every place you visit, every single piece of the world that you interact with is meant to exclude a certain population to make it easy to create. So we call them the edge cases. Now, there is a group that's always the edge case, that's always excluded from everything that we as a society create. And they are called people with disabilities. Now, let's do a quick show of hands here. How many of you arrived here by train today? Or have used the train in the past week to go to work, to do something? Yeah. Now, during your journey, how many of you stopped to think how you would use the touchscreen ticket machines in the station if you couldn't see? Or how you would hear the announcements in the train if you couldn't hear? Or how much more difficult could the journey get if you had to call for special help every time you wanted to get on or get off a train? It's not just these. There are hundreds of small interactions like this that cause disabled people to lead a very limited and dependent life. I mean, if you are a disabled person in our society today, it's a big deal if you can plan a last minute trip anywhere outside with your friends on a nice day like this. Now, we must think if this inconvenience is because of their disability, or is it because of our inability to build a more inclusive world for them? Well, if you haven't really thought about any of this, I don't blame you. Because in the hustle of everyday life, it's very easy to miss what you can't see. I was exactly where you are a year ago, <coughs> completely clueless about what it means to be a disabled person in our society today. I want to take you back with me to my hometown, Chennai, India. About a year ago, I was invited to talk at a blind school to a group of motivated, sharp high schoolers. The topic of the talk was different opportunities with emerging technologies and how every job in the future will be about problem solving. At the end of the talk, I asked them a very simple question. What kind of problems would you like to solve? The answer that I got back from the crowd was very similar. They all said they wanted to be able to read independently. They wanted to be able to do their homework independently. They wanted to go out independently. They just wanted to be like every other normal kid out there. But independence was their biggest struggle, and they were constantly trying to find ways to solve that. The talk and its aftermath stuck with me for a very long time. I felt that if independence was such a big struggle for these kids, then I should probably attempt to do something about it. So around this time, I got back in touch with an old friend of mine who also happens to be an industrial designer. When we spoke about the talk and the feedback that I got from the students, he felt equally compelled to do something about it. We decided that we could solve this problem through the perspective of design thinking. And the first key principle of design thinking is to begin with the users. And so we began by talking to hundreds of visually impaired people from across the world, from all walks of life. The main idea behind these interactions was to understand what it means for a visually impaired person, what independence means to a visually impaired person. We would spend entire days with them, just trying to understand their needs better. We'd start the day with a core assumption and just spend the whole day trying to validate it. Every day from this phase felt like an episode from the Mythbusters. For example, for the longest time, we wondered if visually impaired people use smartphones. 
I mean, how can they, right? Most modern smartphones come with touch screens and they have no buttons on them. We couldn't be more wrong. During our research, we found out that visually impaired people are very adept smartphone users, and most modern smartphones, including the ones in your pocket, have very sophisticated screen readers in them. So this was, you know, we were doing this every day for about six months, at the end of which we had over 100 hours of interviews with visually impaired people. We had two key insights from this exercise. The first was, for most visually impaired people, independence meant access to information. It's kind of obvious when you think about it, because 90% of the information processed by the human brain is visual. So imagine if someone comes along and cuts off 90% of the information source to your brain. Life would get pretty hard to cope with, right? The second key insight that we got was that it's impractical to expect the system and the infrastructure around us to change. There are only that many braille displays that you can put everywhere. So we realized that we must solve this problem from a different perspective, a paradigm shift, one that empowers visually impaired people to access this very visual world. But what can this paradigm shift be? We realized quite early on that to find the best possible solution, we must involve visually impaired people, not just in the research, but also allow them to be part of the solution through the process of co-creation. The co-creation process is the second key principle of design thinking. Let me walk you through a typical co-creation session. We'd have about 10 to 15 visually impaired people from different age groups, different professions. At the beginning of the session, we'd give them a problem, and we would allow them to come up with a solution. Let me tell you, it's exhilarating to see people who have the problem solve it for themselves. The creative energy that visually impaired people put into this exercise was phenomenal. During these sessions, we'd also give them prototypes that we built to get their feedback based on what they told us during previous sessions. So about, after about eight to 10 sessions and about 20 different prototypes later, we felt we had the perfect solution. One that allows visually impaired people to access the world on their own terms. And that solution was artificial intelligence. Now, throughout history, AI has been more hype than reality. Every other decade, we'll have people telling us that you know, the robots are going to take over the world, and there's going to be super intelligence and all that. So why AI, and why now? Over the past few years, the way we interact with the machines around us has changed dramatically. The current mobile revolution that we live in right now has ensured two things. First, the abundance of data. Just last year alone, humans took 1.2 trillion images through a smartphone. That's 1.2 followed by 12 zeros. And computers have gotten both smaller and faster to help us make sense of it all. This is especially true when it comes to recognizing images. We now have tools that can help a visually impaired person extract images, extract information from images as accurately as a human. And this technology is being used to make self-driving cars, to automate big, uh, you know, to automate work at big industries and so on. And now we're using it to help visually impaired people. So, how does AI help a visually impaired person? The first problem that AI solves for a visually impaired person is helping them read text. Now, imagine you're a visually impaired person. You walk into a restaurant, you want to have a nice meal all by yourself. But you can't read. So when the waiter hands you an inaccessible menu card, what you can do today 
is with your smartphone, take a photo of it, and it would read it out to you. Not just menu cards, you could use it to read displays at a train station, the letters that you get from the municipality, or you know, just enjoy a nice evening newspaper. Over the past few years, AI has also gotten really good at reading handwriting. So the Christmas card that you get, you can read that too. So all of this helps make the text in the visual world more accessible. But visual information is a lot more than text. It involves people, objects, and so on. AI can help describe the world in great detail. With AI, a visually impaired person can just walk into a crowded bar, take a look around and find where his friend is sitting and walk right up to him, just as easily as a person who can see. With tools that we have today, AI is already helping people live a more independent and productive life. Just last week, we had a user who said that he was able to help his you know, sighted boss install a version of Windows on his PC. We had a visually impaired mother tell us that she was able to go ahead and help her son with, his home, with the homework for the very first time. All of these people are now accessing information on their own terms, when they want it and how they want it. If there are two things that I want you to take away from today, it's this. First, the world we live in is not accessible. And this alienation is only going to increase as societies get older and as the world moves to a more visual form of information exchange. It's also impractical to expect the infrastructure around us to change. Secondly, the best way to empower a visually impaired person is to give them the tools to access the world on their own terms. And AI is already helping us get there. I'm super excited for a future in which AI, when applied in a meaningful way, can have a truly positive impact on the world. AI can be our biggest strength when we measure its value by not how powerful it is, but by how much it empowers people. But the onus is still on us. The makers, the designers, the engineers, the architects in the crowd to make the world a more inclusive place. Accessibility should not just be a feature, an option, or an afterthought. It has to be at the very foundation of everything that we do as a society. Because humanity truly moves forward only when it's everybody in and nobody out. Thank you.